morning, everybody. And those of you watching online here in person, how are we doing today? Yeah, yeah amen. Well, I'm glad you guys are all here. <laughs> it's been a difficult week, hasn't it? Um, I know every parent, every grandparent just mourns with the people in Uvalde, Texas. I know when I, when I went to uh, drop my kids off at school this week, I did it with a very heavy and anxious heart. Anybody else? I noticed grandparents and parents hugging their kids extra long, taking extra long kisses and hugs and watching them walk all the way in. Uh, I was telling my wife, I contemplated taking all my meetings from the parking lot of the school this week um, just, just, to, just because, right? It's been a difficult time. And I know it c creates a lot of questions in all of our hearts as to how is a Christian supposed to respond in the midst of the evil in this world? Um, I know all of us have asked that question. And uh, as we conclude our series today, I thought it was really pertinent that the, the, what we've been talking about, I think, speaks directly to how Christ Christians should respond in the midst of a world that is broken and dark and full of tragedy. Because we can't respond like the rest of the world. Amen. We have to respond according to God's word, like we talked about last week. And our theme verse in John 10.10 10, for this entire series, I think, speaks directly to this. And I want to I start there, and we'll unpack it together, um, because... Whether we like it or not, for as long as we live on this planet, we're going to be dealing with tragedies. I think it's, hopefully, we can make a difference and there'll be less of them. But the Bible does tell us we live in a broken world. And this is what the Bible says in John 10.10. 10. It says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. The thief in the Bible is the, our enemy, the devil. And as we said in part one of our series, God created the world good. And when he finished creating it, he said, it is very good. In other words, without spot or blemish. Evil, death, tragedy, disease, violence was not supposed to be a part of the human existence. However, our enemy, the devil, came in, tempted Adam and Eve. And when they turned against God, essentially, they handed the world over to the enemy where sin and death can reign. And we've been living in the consequence of that for the last several thousand years. And so where does the, the evil come from? It comes from the fact that we, there is a very real enemy, the devil, that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But here's the good news. Jesus said, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. In other words, life to the fullest is available through Jesus Christ. And so terrible tragedies in the world, circumstances in our lives should remind us that this world is broken because of sin. But the solution is found in Jesus Christ. Amen. The solution is found in Christ, in his word, and through his church, the people of God, to bring the presence of God into this broken and dark world. And I was telling my small group this week that whenever these things happen, and they seem to be happening more often, I mean, even here in Hawaii, there's shootings almost every single day, right? It should, to me, it further steals my resolve that this is why we do what we do as the church. Because if the problem is sin, and the solution is Jesus Christ and the gospel, well, who carries the gospel? It's us, amen? Amen. And while we can look at all the other possible solutions out there, the government needs to do something, we need to change our laws, whatever it is. And listen, I'm open to all of that conversation. I think we all should be. That's not going to change the sin in people's hearts. The only thing that's going to change the sin in, in people's hearts that would perpetrate such evil is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And who carries the gospel of Jesus Christ? It's us. So while sin is the problem, Jesus is the solution, and the church needs to stand in the gap. Can I hear an amen to that? So how should a Christian respond to a broken world by being the church of Jesus Christ? And as we'll see today, by being salt and light to this broken world. This should solidify our resolve that Jesus is the solution. We are his church. We are the solution to this broken world. You know, the, we've been looking through the book of 2 Peter, which is Peter's second epistle to the churches. And the world that Peter wrote this to was a very dark world as well, filled with tons of tragedy. The church is being persecuted heavily at the time. The Romans and the Jewish government wanted to shut down every Christian church, wanted to put Christians in prison. In fact, had many of them put to death. Some of Peter's own closest friends were put to death by the time this letter was written. And so he's writing to the church to basically tell them, how do you be a Christ follower in the midst of this broken world? How do you abound in Christ and live faithfully for him in the middle of violence and death and persecution? And I think... Uh, this book speaks directly to what we're going through right now in this world. And so we're going to conclude our series today by looking at this, this passage of Scripture found in 2 Peter chapter 3. And we're going to pick it up in verse 9 because he's talking to the church now that is wondering, why do these things keep happening? Why does evil persist? When is Jesus going to come back like he said he was? He said he was coming back. He's not here yet. What's going on? And then we're going to pick it up here in, in 2 Peter chapter 3 starting in verse 9 
with this. He said, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. That's the heart of God, that everyone on this planet would come to repentance and to turn to Jesus. But the day of the Lord, in other words, when Jesus comes back and brings with him judgment, the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. God is going to judge the earth one day. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, you are, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless and fall from your secure position, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Three things I want us to see from this passage this morning as it relates to how are Christians to live in the midst of a broken and dark world. First of all, he said, number one, the abundant life amid this broken world is a holy and godly life. It's a holy and godly life. We talked about that back in part one when we started this series. But Peter reiterates it again. What type of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives. We have to work on ourselves first, amen? It's like when you're on the airplane, they say before you put your oxygen mask on anybody else, you got to put it on yourself first. Otherwise, you might pass out and you can't help anybody else. In this context, we need to deal with the sin in our lives first. Otherwise, no one's going to take our message seriously. If we don't have, if we're not growing in godliness, remember we said before, not necessarily perfection because none of us are going to be perfect, but if we're not working on it, working on our own anger, our own bitterness, our own lust, our own pride, our own whatever, then we don't have the authority, the moral authority to tell anyone else, you need to put the oxygen mask on. Because they're going to look at us and they're going to say, well, maybe you should take this word seriously first and then maybe I'll listen to you. And sadly, that's the state of our country. People don't take the church seriously anymore. And the main reason, a, a study was done in 2018, it said because there's so much hypocrisy in the church. People don't believe in the gospel, not because of its claims or because science somehow disproves the Bible, which it does not. It's because they see the hypocrisy in Christians and they say it must not be real then. You guys don't even believe this enough to put the oxygen mask on yourself. Why should I listen to you? And so Peter reminds us that if we want to make a difference in the world and thrive in this world, we got to put the oxygen mask on ourselves and treat this word seriously. And we talked about this in part one, so I'm not going to spend too much time here. But whenever we see tragedy in the world, we need to be the solution. Amen? But we can't be the solution if we're not taking this word seriously ourselves. So it should be an appeal to us to say, hey, I need to take this word seriously. I need to live it so that I can shine a light, as we'll see in a second, so that I can be salt in the midst of this dark world. And maybe you're here today and you're struggling with areas of sin in your life. Listen, don't feel condemned. But that should be a sign to us to say, I better get in small group and talk about this. I better get some help. Maybe we need professional counseling, whatever it is. But I can't let this sin persist in my life. Otherwise, I can't be a part of the solution that God has called us to be in this dark world. Don't settle. Don't settle for the brokenness in our souls. We can't. We need to take this word seriously and say, God, change me so that I can be a part of the change that is necessary in this world. Can I hear an amen to that? But an abundant life begins with a holy and godly life. And again, you can listen to part one. We talk more about this there. But number two, I love this. An abundant life amid this broken world looks forward to a new heaven and a new earth. He said looking forward twice here. And the good news about this new heaven, new earth thing is that God promises he will judge evil. At some point in time, God is going to come back and he's going to judge evil on this planet. Even though it may seem like evil is persisting for a season, even though it may seem like evil and wicked people are getting away with stuff, God will have his justice. Amen? And that ought to bring us comfort, for one, that even if there isn't justice here and the system's corrupt, whatever we want to say, God is going to deal with them at some point in time. No one escapes the justice of God. And that should encourage us and it should also bring a certain amount of fear that, man, I better make sure I'm on the right side then. <laughs> and I'm dealing with the junk in my life because God's not going to let me get away with it neither. But for those that are being mistreated unjustly, dealt with unfairly in this world, God will deal with the evil in this planet one day. And we should look forward to that. 
because God is the one who brings justice, even though we may not see it here. And he's gonna bring a new heaven and a new earth free from all of this sin and death stuff. He's gonna recreate and redo it where we screwed it up, God's gonna fix it. One day that will come, and that's what we look forward to, amen? And that keep, should keep us from getting depressed and down. I was talking to one of the guys in my small group, and he's saying, man, it's hard not to get dark and depressed in the middle of this broken world. We gotta keep looking forward. That God says, I'm gonna, re- I'm gonna fix this one day. You just hang on. You just live a holy and godly life. And as we'll talk about it in just a second, and live your purpose on this earth. Let God deal with the evil, amen? Thirdly, he says here, the abundant life amid this broken world is a purposeful life that brings glory to Jesus. And I want to camp here for the rest of our time this morning. It's a purposeful life that brings glory to Jesus. What did he say? He said, he said, live a holy and godly life. Focus on what's coming. But I want you, verse 18, to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And to him be glory both now and forever. It's not just a benediction. He was saying, I want your life to be focused on bringing glory to God. That everything that we do is about bringing glory to Jesus. And when we focus on these things, we can live an abundant life even in the middle of a broken world. So what does it mean to bring glory to God? I want us to spend a few more moments here on this before we end today. Jesus made it really clear what it looks like to bring glory to Jesus. It's not just singing in church. That's part of it. It's not just being a, a good boy or good little girl, right? But it's to be salt and light. Look at what this pastor says here in Matthew chapter 5, 13. He said, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It, it is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and to be trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. We bring glory to Jesus by being salt and light in the world. Well, what is salt and light? Salt in Jesus' day wasn't primarily a seasoning. Um, Maybe you've heard people say that, um, you know, God wants you to be salt. You know, food without salt tastes bad, so put salt in so it tastes good. So you need to be the the flavor in the world, the the light of of the party. You know, that's actually not the correct interpretation of this because salt in Jesus' day wasn't primarily a seasoning. Salt was a preservative. You'd put salt in meat to prevent it from rotting and decaying. Salt killed the bacteria, dried up the moisture so that the meat would last longer and you could live longer off of salted meat. It wasn't to bring flavor. It was to preserve nutrients and life so that you could survive a little bit longer. So let's think about what that may mean for us. As Christians, we're meant to penetrate into the rot of this world. We're meant to penetrate and to preserve life to kill the bacteria, so to speak, not literally, but to to preserve life in this world. We're meant to go out into the world and to penetrate into the lives of a hurting and the broken and to preserve life. We're called to be the salt of the earth. And look at what it says. If it doesn't do that, it's no longer good for anything but to be thrown out. Why? Because that's your purpose. Our purpose as Christ followers is to be salt to penetrate into this, to society, into the lives of the hurting and the broken, and to preserve life. That's our purpose as Christ's church. Then he gives another example. He uses the metaphor of a lamp, right? You don't light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, you put it on a stand so it can give light to everyone in the house. Think about what light does. It penetrates into darkness, amen? And it illuminates darkness so that we can, we can live our lives even in the midst of darkness. Well, that's what the church is called to do. We're meant to shed light into places that are dark so that we can live and thrive and have abundance even when there is darkness abounding. Jesus is calling us to be salt and light to the world. What does that mean? It means we can't keep to ourselves. It means we have to enter into the rot and the hurt and preserve and to bring light so that other people can see the light of Jesus Christ. And what does that do? It brings glory to our Father in heaven. You know what doesn't bring glory to God is when we just keep to ourselves and live for ourselves. When we hide away, what brings glory to God is when we go out and penetrate into darkness, into the rot, to bring life. Can I hear an amen? Now that's hard. And you know, one of my concerns as I was, as I was you know, just reflecting on, on the shooting and all that, and, and you know, all the talk is about gun control and laws and all that, but there's no talk about what's going to bring change into the hearts of people. 
you know, a study was done in 2018 about a profile of all these active shooters, and maybe you've seen it. It was featured in like Psychology Today and all these different places, but, but there's, there's a few commonalities in all of these shootings that have taken place. Um, most of them are, are young men, sadly. About 90% are young men who were harassed, who felt bullied and harassed by other students, felt mistreated by teachers, felt misunderstood. They were also socially isolated, awkward, they tended to isolate themselves and had few friends, if any. They come, all came from dysfunctional families where the home completely broke down, lack of adult supervision and mentoring. They are all lost and hurting. And while we can and should probably talk about what we can do to prevent weapons from getting in the hands of people that are clearly deranged, we also need to talk about what's going on in our society that enables young men to be hurting and broken and without any intervention. What is causing the evil in people's hearts that you walk into a classroom and shoot children? There's some brokenness and hurting and in that that we also need to talk about. Because if it's not a shooting, it'll be a stabbing. If it's not hurting other people, it'll be hurting yourself or hurting your spouse or your kids. We need to deal with the rot in society that is leading to all of this. But there's no conversation about that. Maybe it's because, and I was talking with someone in my small group, maybe it's because the world doesn't know that there is a solution. Maybe the world thinks there's no hope. People are just broken beyond repair. And so we just kick the can down the road and hope I don't get in trouble for something, you know. But you know what? The Bible says there is hope. Amen? The Bible says there is a solution. It's, but the solution is the church being salt and light. And that's where, I don't know about you, I struggle. Because I want other people to be the solution. <laughs> I want other people to take responsibility and do something about fixing this broken world. But here's what Jesus said, no, no, you are the salt of the earth. Uh, if I was standing there, I'd be like, you must be talking to them, right? You mean, you mean Peter guys, right? No, 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 you, all of you are salt of the earth. You are light of the world. Oh, you mean the government is going to fix this, right? No, 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 you are the light of the world. My people, my church, my children, you are the salt, you are the light. And until the church of Jesus Christ takes this seriously and says, we need to get into the lives of people. We need to penetrate into the hurting and the wounded souls of people and be light to them and salt to them. Until the church does that, sadly, I think this stuff is just going to continue. Until the church takes Jesus' word seriously and says, I'm going to be salt, I'm going to be light, we're going to continue to hear about pain and suffering and all of that. But it's possible. We've seen it possible here in Pearlside. Many of you have seen it possible in your small groups. When the church takes his word seriously, lives can be changed. One great example of this, someone who brought glory to Jesus by being salt and light was a longtime member of our church by the name of Glenn Nakamura. And maybe many of you guys know who Glenn is. Uh, we just recently had his celebration of life this past weekend. And um, longtime member and pillar of our church uh, went home to be with Jesus a little over a year, ago, a year ago. But he touched so many lives and was such a great example I think, of being salt and light. And when I think about salt and light, I think about Glenn. I really do. Um, he used his life to touch the lives of others. And he actually had a profound impact in my life. I've never actually shared this, but when I was a, a young adult just starting out in ministry, I used to go over to where he worked. He, was, he, he managed a grocery store. And I remember sitting in his office a couple of times. He would just encourage me. He'd give me chips. I love that. Chips and cookies. Glenn always, I always walked out with like a bag full of snacks. That's, that's the second reason why I love meeting with him. Besides the encouragement was the snacks. Um, but he always encouraged me. He was one of my first ministry partners and just always encouraged me and just, just cheered me on into what God was calling me to do. But it wasn't just me. He mentored and ministered to so many other people in this church. Um, about 16 years ago, he was diagnosed with a form of muscular dystrophy <clears throat> uh, called muscular atrophy. It was a degenerative disease which had him confined in a wheelchair for the last 16 years. But you know what I love about Glenn? He didn't stop being salt and light. He kept on meeting with people. Even in his wheelchair, he made a way. He said, I'm called to make disciples. I'm going to do that. Nothing's going to stop me. He kept meeting with people. You'd see him around Mililani going to meet with people at Burger King and all these places. He made disciples literally until he went home to be with Jesus. He didn't let anything stop him. And you talk to his friends and his family. He never complained, never felt sorry about himself. He said, I know what I'm called to do. And I'm going to do it until Jesus calls me home. And that's exactly what he did. Even when family and friends were gathering to say their goodbyes, he made sure that every person that came in that wasn't saved heard the gospel before they left. <laughs> it was an amazing, amazing, beautiful time. Even at his celebration of life service, Glenn made sure that everyone heard the gospel while we celebrated his life. I thought, man, that is what being salt and light is. How many of us 
if we had a, a degenerative disease, would say, feel sorry for me. I got my own problems. I can't help anybody else. He said, no, no, I'm called to be salt and light. And he led small groups. He made disciples. He did all these things until Jesus finally called him home. And you know what? He's experiencing his reward in the new heaven and new earth right now. He's with Jesus rejoicing, probably enjoying the life well lived for Christ. But how many of us, we say, no, I can't do that. I can't make a difference in someone else's life. I got my own problems. And I think that's the state of the church in America right now. We're just focused on our own issues, our own problems, and we, we look at the problems in the world and we say, that's someone else's problem. No, 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 that is our problem. If you read the Bible, it is the church's problem. We can't look at anyone else and blame anybody else if we're not making a difference in the lives that God's placed around us. So what does that mean? We go, you know, we got, we got, no, it's just one person. It's just one life that God's placed around us that's hurting and broken. Do we enter into that situation like salt and light and say, I want to bring light and I want to bring life into this person? Or do we just kick the can down the road and make it someone else's problem? Glenn wouldn't do that. He made everybody that came across him his problem. And he embraced everybody and said, I'm going to be salt and light to this person. What about us? We can look at the things in the world and be angry, or we can say, I'm going to be a part of the solution. And being the part of the solution is precisely by saying, okay, Jesus, you said to be salt and light. I'm going to do that to my coworker, my neighbor, my family member, whoever. It doesn't have to be a thousand people. If each one of us reached one person, the world would be a vastly different place. And I'm not just talking about here in Pearlside and you guys watching online. If every Christian did that, the world would be a vastly different place. But instead, most of us say, no, I'm, I don't want to be salty today. I don't want to penetrate into darkness today. I'm going to put a cover on my lamp today because I got my own problems. Thank God for people like Glenn Nakamura that said, no, I don't care what I'm going through. I'm going to be salt and light no matter what until my dying day. That's the solution. That's the only solution. And Jesus said this over 2,000 years ago. You are the salt. You are the light. Not anybody else. It's you and it's me. Amen. And all of us know someone who's going through something. Maybe they're not on the verge of becoming homicidal, but they're going through stuff. Maybe their marriage is falling apart, or maybe they're dealing with financial troubles right now. I mean, who isn't, right? Maybe they're going through a hardship, and they don't know that there is a God who wants to walk with them through that. Well, it's our job to be salt and get in and to be able to penetrate and bring life and light into that wounded and hurting person. I just read an article this morning <clears throat> as I was getting ready about the power of just asking someone how they're doing. Just the power of saying, how are you doing? And sincerely caring, not like, hey, how you doing? Okay, good, and then just going on, right? But I mean, sincerely, how are you doing? No, really, how are you doing? Tell me. And then you sit there and we listen. I'm guilty of that. How you doing? I actually don't want to hear sometimes. That's just a greeting, like, hey, you know, I just want you to say hey back so I can go on my business. But the power of actually caring about how someone's doing. How refreshing would that be? How, how, how salty would that be? How much light would that bring into someone's life if we actually did that? Especially to a person who's dark and hurting in our workplace, maybe. Or a student that you know of, a niece, a nephew, a friend of your, your niece or nephew, whatever. And you actually cared. Salt and light could penetrate into darkness and maybe bring transformation. But we can't ignore, we can't just kick the can down the road and make it someone else's problem. Jesus said this, <clears throat> and we talked about this before, verse 12 of John chapter 15. This is my commandment. Commandment, not suggestion, by the way. He said, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. John 15. Greater love is no one than this, than someone lay down his life for his friends. This is my commandment, that you love one another. He wasn't suggesting it. He was commanding it. If you are my disciple, if you are a Christian, and you believe in this word, you have to love one another. Turn to your neighbor and tell them, you have to love one another. It's a command. Many Christians treat it like an optional suggestion. Hey, you might want to think about loving one another, but eh, if you don't, you don't, right? No, it's not a suggestion. It's a command. And it's not just the people that you like, by the way. It's the people that are hard to love sometimes. It's the people that are difficult. It's the people that are dark in their soul. God calls us to love them. And maybe if we did that more, we could help people before they become violent, suicidal, or homicidal because again every active shooter had a profile and people now we're saying they, they yeah they saw the darkness they saw the evil and they just didn't want to do anything about it so i kick, kick the can down the road make it someone else's problem until it becomes all our problem or we can be salt and light into someone and maybe save them and save others how do we live to bring glory to god and to love others how do we do that 
We bring glory to Jesus by loving others and making disciples. Jesus' last words before ascending to heaven, his last words, and you know, last words usually hold some significance, right? I mean, if I was planning my last words, it wouldn't be something trivial like, hey, make sure you turn off the lights because electricity is not free, you know? I wouldn't say that. It would, <laughs> I say that every day, you know, but it would be something well thought out, right? It would be something that, that I want my kids to remember forever to guide their lives, right? How much more intentional do you think Jesus' last words were? Well, this is his last words before he ascended into heaven. He said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. What was his last words? Go and make disciples. His last words were, go into the world and make disciples of the hurting, the broken, teaching them to obey this word that's what I want you to do, church, his last words. And I love how he set it up. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. I mean, man, that's, that's it. You're setting you up, right? Like, if I ever walked into the house and talked to my kids, hey, kids, sit down. All authority in this house has been given to me. You know I'm about to say something important, right? And they're going to listen, like, okay, what's dad about to say? Because he's tripping right now, right? Talking about authority, right? But Jesus was serious. In other words, he's saying, in case you guys forgot, I'm the Lord. In case you forgot, I just rose from the dead. You saw it all. I have all authority in heaven and earth. Their ears are perked up now. What's he going to say? What's he going to tell us to do as God in the flesh? Is he going to tell us to memorize the Bible? I bet he's going to tell us to memorize the Bible, Peter. I bet you that's what he's going to say. What is he going to say? I bet he's going to say to give all our money to the poor. I bet you that's what he's going to say. I bet he's going to say, you know, you know, be a good person and don't ever sin. That's probably what he's going to say. Yeah, you're right, John. What did Jesus say? He didn't say any of those things. He said, I want you to go and make disciples. That's the most important thing. Well, oftentimes... Christians, we make other things most important, right? Now, I'm all for memorizing the Bible. I'm all for reading it and studying. Oh, 100%. I love that. But that's not the most important thing. The most important thing for Jesus was to make disciples. Why? Because the world is hurting. The world is broken. People are lost. Sin is the problem. The gospel is the solution. Who carries the gospel? It's us. That's why it's the most important thing. And if the church for the last 2,000 years had taken this seriously, I think our world would be very different today. But I'm guilty of it just like anybody of saying, I don't want to deal with the brokenness in this world. I don't want to deal with that hurting person. Just give me people who are, you know, well-adjusted and normal. I'll disciple them. But the hurting, yeah, I don't really want to deal with that. What did Jesus say? No, no, no. You are salt. You are light. Go and make disciples. The only solution is the gospel. I had, I had an opportunity to practice this probably about 10 years ago. I was in my small group and well, actually, I met a guy after service. His wife introduced him to me. And uh, you, you know when you meet someone and they're going through something, you can tell? <laughs> like, this dude was going through stuff. Like, he had that look on his face of just, like, life is hard, life sucks. And, and he, he also had that look on his face, like, I don't really want to talk to you, Pastor. And I was like, great. This is, this is a great, wonderful conversation. And so we started talking, and, uh, you know, and, and the wife was like, I, I really want him to go to small group. Now, you know when your wife is trying to make you do something, husbands? Even more so, you don't want to do it. So I was like, stop, calm down. I'm going to invite him. <laughs> like, you know, like, I'm going to invite him to group, but you forcing him is going to make this a little harder. Anyway, so I finally invited him to group, and he said he would come. I was like, okay, great. And so getting ready for a small group, knowing that this dude was going to come, I had to get myself ready emotionally because I knew this dude was dealing with some stuff. I didn't know what it was at the time. So he finally came to group. We were meeting at Zippy's in Pearl City. Uh, he came in. I introduced him to the other guys. He sat down, and one of the first things he said as he introduced himself is, hi, my name is, I won't say his name, my name is Blank, and this week I wanted to kill myself. I was like, oh, man. I knew it. I had a feeling, but darn it, I was hoping it wasn't going to be this heavy. And he unpacked about how he and his wife were fighting all the time and how he just, he just kept fantasizing about blowing his brains out. I'm just like, oh, my goodness. How do I do it? And I looked at the guys in my group. They're looking at me like, you invited this dude. <clears throat> I was like, <laughs> make a really long story short, because it was a really long story. We started meeting up one-to-one -one before a group. I started going over the one-to-one -one book with him, started discipling him, got him to listen to the Bible and read the Bible and all this. Long story short, within just a couple of months, he completely changed, completely changed, countenance changed. He's one of the, the most joyful, positive people in our group, one of the anchors in our group, and just encouraging other people. He started doing one-to-one -one with another guy. Completely life changed. His marriage got healed. His relationship with his family was transformed. And I look back at that, and I'm almost, I am ashamed of myself saying, I don't want to deal with this person because he's too hurting and he's too broken. When God in heaven is going, um, we can change him. <laughs> the Holy Spirit and the Word can change him. 
if you'll be salt and light. I don't want to be salt and light, man. This is too messy. That's too much rot. I can't get involved with that. It's too dark. I, there's no way the light can penetrate that, really, because if the Bible is true and the Holy Spirit is real, I'm pretty sure God's going to hold true to his word. But he's not going to do it without the church. He said, you are salt and light. That means we got to get in there. And it was messy. We had some tough conversations, some dark moments of conversation in, in, in helping him to learn about Jesus, but the Holy Spirit changed him. And he and his family are living together now happily uh, in, in Las Vegas. And I, I, see, I see them every now and then. I'm like, wow, God, what a change. What a transformation. It's possible. Amen? We have to believe that it's possible. And we have to have the will to say, I'm going to be salt and light and enter into a difficult and broken situation so that God can do what God does. He's not going to do it without us. He wants us to breathe salt and light into people's lives. Can I hear an amen? Sin is the problem. Gospel is the solution. We need to take the gospel into the lives of people. And we never know what that one life will do, what touching one person can do. We never know what kind of impact that can have. But when we step out, God wants to step in and break into a person's life. One final example as I close that just seared this into my heart is a story of a young man that I had the privilege of ministering to many years ago by the name of Alan Sue. And many of you know him, and I talk about Alan every now and then. Um, but this is Alan and his wife. Together now, they're missionaries in Japan, <clears throat> doing great things. He teaches English at a, at a pretty prominent college there, and he's reaching out to, to students and bringing the gospel and bringing light. And um, what's amazing to me, well, so I met him when he was a student at Punahou School. He was a senior getting ready to graduate. And uh, my wife was leading a small group there. Well, we weren't married at the time, but uh, she was leading a small group at Punahou School, and she asked me to come because there were was some guys that were starting to come. So I came, and can I be honest with you? I didn't want to go because I'm a public school kid. I have a chip on my shoulder when it comes to Punahou. <laughs> bad experiences in sports and things, and, you know. And if you're a private school kid, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> my son now goes to private school, so I'm healing. Anyway, so I went, <laughs> and... Uh, I went, and uh, then this guy walks in. This, this guy, Alan, walks in. And you got to imagine, he had hair all the way down past to his knees, Coke bottle glasses, and a look on his face like, screw you guys. That's, that's just, just going to be honest. That's what he looked like when he walked in. And, I, and at the same time, I looked at him. I was like, oh, no. I don't want to deal with this. Like, I, I, didn't, I didn't know his story or anything about his background, but I didn't want to deal with a clearly hurting and broken person. When you see a person like that, by the way, they're going through stuff. They're going through stuff. And he was going through stuff. And inside, I didn't want to deal with him. Like, oh, I just want to deal with the, the nice-looking public school kids, you know? I mean, private school kids. You know, I just want to deal with the, you know, the people that don't have a lot of problems. Can I just get those? I'll teach them about Jesus. But there was Alan sitting there, and, and we had a conversation. And, and to make a really long story short, he got saved, started discipling him. And he started leading a small group at the University of Hawaii. He was one of my college leaders. And after, after church one Sunday, one of the kids in his group, one of the college students in his group came up to me. And he said, hey, Billy, did you know that when Alan was a senior at Punahou, he was depressed and suicidal? I said, yeah, I kind of figured, but I, I never heard the fullness of that story. And he said, did you know that he was planning on, on carrying out a shooting on the last day of school? I said, I did not know that. Our Alan? He said, yeah, Alan. I grabbed my phone. Alan, we need to talk right now. <laughs> But come to find out, he was depressed, he was hurting, he was suicidal, he had access to weapons, and he was planning on carrying out a shooting. He even told one of his friends, don't come to school on the last day, and you'll find out why. I had an opportunity to, to interview Alan, and we made this video back in 2018, just a short three minutes, and I want you to hear his heart on how God broke in and changed his life, about the darkness that he was walking through, and how the gospel came and brought healing and transformation. Take a look. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to kill as many people as I could to show them this truth. My dad was a doctor, my mom was a nurse. Very intellectual household. Kind of the thing that science tells you is you're a result of evolution, you're a result of all these random chances that just happen to come together perfectly. It's very meaningless. Your life exists to make more humans. That's not a purpose. That's not a reason to live. Combined with that too, I just got bullied a lot in high school. I mean, I had thick Coke bottle glasses. It's kind of the typical nerd, but I wasn't the nerd who did well in school. Almost kicked out several times. And it just really brought me really, really low. 
contemplating suicide like every single day where I thought I found this truth that you live, you die, and that's it. No real reason or point to any of this. What is the best way to show people this truth? If I buy guns, if I make bombs, I can tell the world this truth in the best way possible by showing it to them, by making them experience it. And so that I was planning to do a school shootout. Thankfully, one of the friends that I had at the time, she invited me to a small group. Because this was the girl I liked at the time, thankfully God used that because I thought that, oh, maybe she'll start liking me if I go. But it's really, really weird because that whole discussion was about me. Who told these people about me? Who told you, the leader, about me, what I'm going through? At the same time, I'm getting angrier and angrier in my mind. I'm starting to have more questions. And the weird thing is, these questions that I had were getting answered. Finally, there was a Friday night youth service that there was an opportunity for me to go to and still very skeptical. I still remember April 30th, 2004. They were giving a message from the Bible about my life. It was weird because it was almost as if it was the speaker and me and something else. And the main scripture is from Jeremiah 29, 11, where it talks about God has a plan for you, He has a hope for you. And it finally hit me that I'm not a product of random chance. I do have a purpose. My life has a purpose. Even what I suffer through has a purpose. And it finally just struck me that I have hope. If it wasn't for you and people like you, a campus minister on my campus, without someone reaching out to the next generation, I wouldn't be here. I would be dead. And chances are a lot of other people would be dead. I mean, I was really at a point where I wanted to show the world my truth by taking as many lives as I could. Now I want to give my life in a sacrifice on the mission field to tell the world God's truth, His gospel truth. If we can really reach people when they're young, when they're open, when they're searching, before they think they've found these answers, mm. that's when we can just change their lives dramatically. Thank you for laughing at that old video of me, by the way. I appreciate that very much. <laughs> but you know, it's, I believe it 100% that if we can get into what Alan said, if we can get into the lives of people while they're hurting and broken, especially while they're young, that's why Pearlside Church invests so heavily in reaching the next generation, we can bring change and transformation into people's lives and into the world. And I couldn't believe it when, you know, I heard the story and I sat with him and just unpacked that journey and, and you realize, like, man, he was serious, he had the will and he had the means, but God broke in. God broke in, stopped him in his tracks, and it took a reluctant person like me, who didn't really know what they were doing back in 2004, to bring the gospel, to be salt and light, and the Holy Spirit did the rest. And you know what that tells me? All of us can do that. Amen? Every single one of us can have an impact. I'm not saying we need to go out and look for people, you know, but God's already placed them in our lives. God's placed hurting people in our lives right now. And maybe you're sitting here and you're thinking about that coworker, or that niece, or that nephew, or that neighbor that's hurting and broken. And you're saying, man, I hope someone helps that person. I think the Holy Spirit is saying, that, that person is you, to be salt and light. Maybe it's just as simple as talking to them in the break room, inviting them out to coffee, saying, how are you doing, and sincerely listening as they share their story. Like we, like we say here all the time, ask people to tell you their story, listen, and then pray for them in that moment of need. You realize how powerful that is? A person that's hurting, the Holy Spirit can break in. Alan felt like the whole discussion was about him. I didn't know anything about this dude. We were just talking about God, and the Holy Spirit was shining a light and rubbing that salt in, and it was doing something in his soul. And I remember when he came to that service Friday night, he showed up, and he sat like right around in this area over here. And as I was preaching, I said, anyone want to receive the Lord? He raised his hand. I said, if you receive the Lord, come to the front. And he came straight up to the front. And I said, okay, God, you're doing something in this dude's life. I had no idea what was going on, but the Holy Spirit was working. See, a lot of times we, we, want, we want to understand how this is all going to work from start to end. I don't think that's possible all the time. God doesn't expect us to understand how he's going to change a person's life. He just wants us to be salt and light. Just show up. 
be a, li- a light of love and the gospel in someone's life. Listen to their story, pray for them, and watch what God does from there. But here's what we can't do. We can't be salt in a salt shaker. It does no good. We need to be penetrating the rotting and the decaying. We can't be light hidden away or covered up. We have to be light shining out into the darkness. And God's placed all of us in places of darkness. Some of you, man, your workplace is real dark. But maybe it's, you're, it's dark because God wants you to be the light. You're like, man, my, my workplace is decaying. Maybe it's because you're called to be the salt. Amen. Some of you, maybe it's your own home and the people in your house. The good news is salt and light can penetrate and can bring change. Amen. Jesus said, that's us. So we have to take those steps of faith to be salt and light into this world. Can I hear an amen to that? Sin is the problem. The gospel is the solution. We have to be bearers of the good news. Amen. Can I pray for us? Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, first of all, for penetrating into the darkness of our lives and letting your light shine into the broken places, the hurting places. And and God, thank you for saving us and changing us. Now, Lord, help us to turn around and intentionally go out into the world of broken and hurting people to be salt and light to them, to enter into their hurt and to shine the light of God's love. Lord, help us to be your people, your army, your hands and your feet in the midst of this broken world. Help us not to turn a blind eye Help us not to say that's someone else's problem. But Lord, whoever you've placed in our lives, you've done so for a reason. Lord, help us to see the hurting and broken all around us. And it just starts with one, one person at a time, that we would love them into a relationship with you that could literally change everything. Help us to be your church in this hour. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. When you came in, you received a a communion cup, and we're going to partake of communion together. Communion is meant to be a time of remembrance where we remember the gospel. Jesus said, whenever you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And the elements of communion are symbolic and are meant to be reminders to us of Christ's sacrifice for us. So go ahead and take out that and you can peel off the first layer and and, um, uh, that reveals the bread. Jesus said, this is my body that was broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We remember how Jesus laid down his life for us. He literally gave everything so that we could be redeemed and restored. Amen? And similarly, he calls us to give our lives so that others can be restored. But today, first of all, we just thank him for healing and saving us. Amen? Will you hold the bread in your hand? I want to pray. Father, we thank you that you loved us so much that you allowed your body to be beaten and broken and nailed to the cross for our sins. God, help us to never take that for granted, but to always live our lives in gratitude for what you've done. You saved us. You died for us. You redeemed us. Lord, help us to live grateful lives that now love others the way that you've loved us. Thank you for your body, your life that was given. In Jesus' name, amen. You may partake of the bread. You can go ahead and open up the the second part, which reveals the cup. Scripture tells us that after supper, Jesus blessed the cup, and he said, take and drink each one of you. This is my, this is the new covenant in my blood. And it was the blood of Jesus that washes our sins away. It's the blood of Jesus that renews us so that we can live a life of purpose and meaning on this earth. It's the blood of Jesus that will ultimately deal with the sin in this world. And so we Bless the cup this morning. Will you bow your heads with me? Father, we thank you for your blood that was shed, that washed all of our sins away. You didn't hold our sins against us. You washed it away with your blood. And so this morning we say thank you. Thank you, Lord. Help us now to live a life of purpose and meaning, to help the sins of others to be washed away by your blood as well, to redeem the lives of others, that they too could live a life of purpose and meaning because of you. Help us to be your church. In Jesus' name, amen. You may partake of the cup. You can go ahead and put that down. I'm going to ask us all to just stand for a moment. I'm going to ask the worship team to lead us in this chorus of worship. And as we sing, let's lift up the the name of Jesus, believing that through him our lives are different, and through us this world will be different as well. Amen. Let's worship him together.